There's only one star in our solar system, the Sun. And all the planets orbit the star. But there are also systems where a planet orbits two suns. For example, Kepler-16b. It's an inhospitable and cold place, made of half rock, half gas. But the coolest thing there is that if you visited this planet, you'd see two sunsets and have two shadows. But astronomers seem to have found something rarer and more bizarre. There might be a planet that orbits three stars at once. The GW Orionis star system is around 1,300 light years away from our planet. It's composed of three orange rings. They're made of dust and nested inside one another. In the center of this system, you can see three stars. Two of these stars are binary. It means they orbit each other. The third star revolves around them. Scientists have found out that the three rings are misaligned. The innermost ring swings widely in its orbit, and the outermost ring has a tilt of 38 degrees. So, astronomers came up with two theories. The first theory says the break in these rings occurred because three suns created torque at the center of the entire system. Torque is a gravitational force that always acts toward the center. But sometime later, this theory was written off. There wasn't enough turbulence in these rings for this theory to work. The second theory claimed that this phenomenon could be happening because a planet formed inside one of these rings. A young planet could affect the gravitational balance of the three-ring system and be the reason they were spread so far apart. There's a specific gap in the dust cloud. Based on its size, the planet we're talking about must be a large gas giant the size of our Jupiter. All space objects have been formed thanks to gravity pulling matter together. If there's even the slightest rotation at the beginning, the spin rate increases with time, especially when an object starts collapsing. That's why all space objects rotate, including dust particles and even black holes. Black holes lose their mass because of a thing called Hawking radiation. Their event horizons are becoming smaller, but this process is very, very slow. A black hole's event horizon is a point of no return. It's like a boundary that surrounds a black hole. And nothing, including light and radiation, can escape once it crosses this boundary. The average black hole would need billions of times the age of our universe to disappear completely. Our home Milky Way galaxy might also contain a supermassive black hole, but we're in no danger. One of the closest large black holes, V4647 Sagittarii, is most likely 20,000 light years away. It's safe to observe the effects black holes create from a distance. Problems start when you get too close because of their mind-boggling gravitational force. Galaxies can consume one another, which is one of the ways how they evolve over time. Our closest neighbor is called Andromeda, and it's currently munching on one of its satellite galaxies. In the past, Andromeda ate at least two others. Plenty of star clusters are scattered all over this galaxy. Andromeda must have stolen these stars from other galaxies. Scientists have finally managed to identify those stars. They have tracked them back to galaxy mergers that happened billions of years ago. 10 billion years ago, our home galaxy also went through a collision. That's why now, its halo isn't like the ones other spiral galaxies have. Scientists first thought it was several small collisions, but then they realized that most of these space objects in the Milky Way came from a single source. It was another galaxy, Enceladus, that the Milky Way collided with. The Milky Way and Andromeda galaxy might collide, but it's unlikely to happen in the next 4.5 billion years. Neutrinos are electrically neutral particles that are so powerful that they can go through miles and miles of lead and nothing will stop them. Some of them are passing through your body as you're watching this. Neutrinos get formed both in the nuclear reactions inside alive stars and in the supernova explosions when stars go out. These particles are nearly massless. They need less than three seconds to get to the surface of the sun. And then they can reach our planet in only eight minutes. There's a planet, TOI-1231b, around 90 light years away from Earth. It's similar to our Neptune. It's a gas giant, but the most interesting thing is that this planet is likely to be rich in atmosphere. The planet is over three and a half times as large as Earth and a bit warmer than we're used to, 134 degrees Fahrenheit. It orbits a red dwarf star way smaller than our sun. 
But this star is also much older. One year on the planet is only 24 Earth days long. Even though the planet is close to its parent star, it remains relatively cold. That's because its star is on the cooler side too. Astronomers think they've seen clouds in the atmosphere of this mysterious planet. And maybe they're even made of water. This star and planet system is moving away from Earth pretty fast. That's why scientists easily detected hydrogen atoms that were escaping from the planet's atmosphere. Yep, that means the planet may even have a tail. A hypothetical white hole is a bizarre space object that is the opposite of a black hole. It's intensely bright and was first mentioned by Einstein in his theory of gravity. Most often, scientists talk about white holes in the context of wormholes. There's a theory that a black hole is like some sort of entry point to a tunnel that takes you through space and time. In this case, a white hole might be an exit located somewhere else in the universe. On the other hand, white holes don't necessarily need to be exits from wormholes. They could also be a slow motion replay of how original black holes were formed. So the formation of a black hole starts with an old massive star. After it collapses under its own weight, it usually turns into a black hole. But sometimes, quantum processes don't turn a star into a black hole. Instead, they make a white hole that starts spewing out the matter of the original star again. But so far, this is just a theory. Some planets like Mars and Venus have pretty intense weather with powerful storms. And now, an equally strong space hurricane might have come to Earth. It was a swirling mass of air about 620 miles wide. Satellites spotted the hurricane hundreds of miles above the North Pole, somewhere in the Earth's upper atmosphere. The hurricane was raining not water, but electrons. It lasted almost eight hours before it finally broke down. It was spinning in a counterclockwise direction. It's possible there are oceans hidden under the surface of the moons surrounding Uranus. Scientists have also been investigating the oceans on Jupiter's moon Europa and Saturn's moon Enceladus. These oceans are hidden below the moon's icy crusts. Uranus has 27 moons. Five of them are especially big. Those are Umbriel, Titania, Oberon, Miranda, and Ariel. Back in the 1980s, when people sent Voyager 2 to get us some images of these five moons, scientists found out that they had lots of craters and were made up of ice and rock. Pictures astronomers got then also showed signs of liquid water. It was erupting from the moon's depths and freezing on the surface. One of the most plausible explanations was the oceans under the surface. As a moon moves around a planet, the magnetic field of that planet tugs at it. That is how the moon stays in its orbit. This tug generates an electrical current that transforms into a magnetic field. Such a magnetic field is called induced. And subsurface oceans might be the reason why this induced field can be produced. Saturn is well known for its famous rings, but Neptune, Uranus, and Jupiter also have rings. At the same time, Saturn has something really special we've never seen on any other planet. It's this huge hexagon storm moving around the planet's north pole. Each of its sides is almost 7,500 miles long. That's an area so great, we could place almost four Earths inside. According to thermal images, this hexagonal cloud pattern goes down into Saturn's atmosphere for around 60 miles. The planet is hiding behind thick clouds, and sunlight can't get through them. That's why astronomers can't see what exactly is going on there. But there are theories. Saturn is a gas giant. When gas deep inside the planet gets heated, it strays further out. Huge amounts of energy are released along with that gas, which makes it rise, expand, and lose density. The same processes cause hurricanes and tornadoes on our planet. On Saturn, whirling gases come out of a high pressure zone located within Saturn's outer layers. And these gases trigger a powerful storm of such an unusual shape. ...of fire and smoke fly upward, and the rocket launches. The Delta IV Heavy is one of the most powerful rockets people have ever made. Three massive engines burn tons of fuel, helping the spacecraft gain altitude. The two side boosters undock, leaving the common booster core for further ascent. When in orbit, the rocket releases its payload. This is the Parker Solar Probe, the first spacecraft to touch the sun. And we'll follow its journey step by step. 
the probe was launched on August 12, 2018, and began its journey toward our star. The sun is 93 million miles away from Earth. That's 390 times the Earth-Moon distance and 36,000 times the width of the United States from coast to coast. The particles of light that the sun emits need eight minutes to travel this distance. For our conventional rockets, that journey would take more than 200 days. But the Parker Solar Probe covered it faster using gravitational maneuvers. On its way from the Earth to the sun, the probe circled around our neighbor, Venus. All it had to do was enter the planet's gravitational field and let it attract itself. At this point, our space probe got an extra boost, and it didn't need to waste any fuel. After making one orbit, the space probe's engines changed the trajectory, and the probe left the orbit of Venus. It got enough acceleration to travel to the sun. And on November 5, 2018, the Parker Solar Probe made its first approach to the sun. Before touching its surface, the spacecraft had to enter the star's orbit first. To achieve this, it did even more gravitational maneuvers. Only after that did it start circling the sun, the heaviest object in the solar system with the most powerful gravity. So, it'll give the probe an incredible amount of acceleration with each flyby. The Parker Solar Probe was constantly moving between two points. Those were the perihelion and aphelion. Look, here's the sun, and here's the probe's orbit in the shape of an ellipse. The closest point to the sun is the perihelion. The sun was pulling the probe there at an incredible speed. At this point, the probe began to move away from the star. It still had a lot of speed and energy, but it was struggling against the gravitational force of the star. So it gradually slowed down. The point where the probe lost all its acceleration is called aphelion. The star's gravitational force won, and the probe began to move back toward the sun, picking up speed again. The probe made several circles following a stable orbit, but then its orbit intersected with that of Venus again. Another gravitational maneuver, and after that, the Parker Solar Probe's trajectory shifted slightly, and it gained more speed. The perihelion point of its orbit was now closer to the sun. The probe made several more circles following this new orbit. Then again, it neared Venus. Another approach to the sun. Each encounter with Venus corrected the probe's trajectory and gradually reduced its distance from our star. In April 2021, the Parker Solar Probe finally came so close to the sun that it touched its corona. Although the actual distance between the probe and the sun was 5.3 million miles, that still counted as a touch. Let's look at the structure of our star by cutting it in half. This is the core of the sun. It's about a quarter of its width. The core is 150 times as dense as water. Because of the intense pressure and high temperature, nuclear reactions occur there. Hydrogen gets converted into helium, giving off an incredible amount of heat and radiation. The next layer is the radiation zone. This is where the heat is transferred from the core to the next layers. But the photons here don't move in an outward direction. They can be directed anywhere and re-radiated many times. Scientists believe that the average time it takes a photon of light to travel from the core to the next layer of the sun is about 10,000 to 170,000 years. Then there's the convection zone. This is what's considered to be the surface of the sun. But it's not a solid surface. It's an ocean of hot plasma. It looks like a bee honeycomb. That's because the heated plasma rises from the lower layers, creating something like mini geysers. And while it's still hot in the middle of those geysers, their edges cool down, creating an amazing pattern on the sun's surface. The next layers are the sun's atmosphere. First, the photosphere. This is the layer that gives off light. And that's exactly what you see when you look at the sun. But careful, don't do that. You need special equipment to look at our star. The photosphere is up to 250 miles thick. This is about the height at which the International Space Station moves above Earth. Then, the chromosphere, or the sphere of color. This layer of the sun's atmosphere gives the star its reddish hue. Solar prominences appear here. Those are powerful emissions of matter leaving the surface of the sun. Their speed can reach 430 miles per second. At some point, they get caught by the star's magnetic field and pulled back. And then there's the corona, a gaseous envelope of the sun. The most powerful ejections take place there. You can see the corona during eclipses, when the moon covers the solar disk. Then you can notice some kind of glow around the star. This is the corona. It extends for millions of miles around the sun. 
and the Parker Solar Probe touched precisely that area. That's where solar material and radiation are still tied to the star's gravity and don't fly off into space. And all that is beyond that area is the solar wind. It's the material and radiation that managed to escape the sun's gravity and set off into space. The Parker Solar Probe surprised astronomers by providing more information about this boundary. It turns out it's not a perfect circular wall like we used to think. The boundary is broken and uneven. It looks more like a mountain range. These bumpy regions have such a shape because of the uneven flow of plasma from the surface of the sun. The larger and more powerful the flow, the farther the boundary is from the star's surface. But scientists don't know yet what exactly causes this difference. After making the flyby around the sun, the Parker Solar Probe continued its journey and started to move away from the star again. Researchers are expecting another four approaches in 2022. In August 2023, the probe will make a flyby around Venus. It'll gain more speed and approach the sun at a record close distance. The next Venus flyby will happen in 2024. And hopefully, the Parker Solar Probe will be able to withstand the high temperatures and radiation so close to the sun. Luckily, scientists have taken care of that. The probe has a solar shield. It's attached to the side of the probe that will face the star. It's about the size of a house window and about four and a half inches thick. It's made of a special material that can withstand a temperature of about 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. That's almost six times higher than the temperature of a regular kitchen oven. The body of the probe is made of a white material that reflects sunlight. All the scientific equipment is placed right in the center of the shadow of this shield. If the sun's rays hit the unprotected body of the probe at close range, all the equipment will be out of action in just a few tenths of a second. The Parker Solar Probe is equipped with the Electromagnetic Fields Investigation Instrument. This is a system for measuring electric and magnetic fields, radio waves, temperature, and plasma density. The Wide Field Imager for the Parker Solar Probe, or WISPER, is an optical telescope, the one that took those stunning images of the moving plasma in the sun's corona. These streamers are what you see during solar eclipses. The Solar Wind Electrons, Alphas, and Protons investigation measures protons, electrons, and helium ions. It helps scientists study solar winds. It often harms our technology. Unexpected flares on the surface of the sun can cause severe solar winds. They can burn chips and satellites orbiting Earth. Given that we have the ISS, where people work all the time, we need to know more about solar winds and how to protect ourselves from them. While the Parker Solar Probe continues its research, it's already set several world records. It's the closest to the sun human-made object. It's also the speed record holder. During its final approach to the sun, the probe reached a speed of 101 miles per second. That means it could cover the distance from New York to Los Angeles in just 24 seconds. And a trip around Earth would take about four minutes. A journey to the moon in such a spacecraft would only take 40 minutes. In 2025, the Parker Solar Probe will make its closest approach to the sun reaching a speed of about 430,000 miles per hour. But even this speed is only 0.064% of the speed of light. The sun isn't technically the center of our solar system. It's in a space called the Berry Center. It depends on which planet you're standing in. The Berry Center is usually closest to the object with the greater mass. So, since we're on Earth, the true center of the solar system is the sun, but not the center of it. With respect to Jupiter, the Berry Center is actually outside the Sun's surface. Jupiter is 318 times bigger than Earth, so the balance is different. The planets don't really revolve around the Sun, but around their common center of mass. Imagine balancing a pencil on the tip of your finger. You'd have to place it right in the center so that it doesn't tip on each side. Because the pencil has its mass equally distributed, it's easy to assume that everything balances its way like that, especially in outer space. But try balancing a hammer on the tip of your toe. Chances are you'll walk out of here with a broken toe. Its true berry center is close to the hammerhead rather than the actual center where you'd grip it. Earth and the sun's berry center is like that hammer. The center of mass is more or less in the center of the object. Realistically, if the sun were to rotate around Earth, then our little blue planet would have to be just as big as the sun, or bigger. We can't disregard the other planets in our solar system, 
which means they all will have to rotate around us as well. But in the ancient days, bright minds always thought everything revolved around the Earth. They called this the geocentric model. And this made sense to them, because it looked like everything above us was spinning around us. The sun and the moon played vital roles in human history, and we didn't feel insignificant in the universe until way later on. In ancient Greece and the Middle Ages, the big brains used the geocentric model to study space. It wasn't until the 16th century that that model changed. Back in those times, they couldn't even imagine that everything revolved around the sun. And they didn't have the knowledge to back any of this up. The Earth can't be the center of the solar system because it's not large enough for the job. For the conditions to suit the enormous size, life would have evolved differently. We'd probably be less dependent on oxygen. Some animals, like whales and dolphins, can stay for hours without taking a single breath. They can even sleep underwater. So the humans of the sun-sized Earth would have specialized lungs and wouldn't need to constantly be taking in air. It means that the plant life would be limited, with just a few shrubs here and there. There are trillions of trees around the world, but the main contributor to producing oxygen is the algae in the ocean. With such vast real estate of oceans and seas, the algae sitting on top are pumping out the air we breathe. Oxygen wouldn't be so abundant on this planet, but our breathing mechanisms might rely on carbon dioxide, another common gas found on other planets. If the planet is hot, then water will be scarce. We would only find it on certain parts of the planet, like mountaintops. The ground would be too scorched for anything to survive in properly. We can forget about seasons as well. The sun is currently just large enough to give us what we need. But since the Earth would be so large, and the sun would be another celestial body emanating heat, we'd always feel like we're inside a microwave. The days and nights will be different, and not much precipitation will happen. With so much heat produced in the core, earthquakes and volcanoes would likely erupt all the time. The surface would practically be a scorching plain of red magma floating around. This would be the true red planet. But if we had the same landscape like on Earth, living somewhere near the mountains could save you. The mountains would still be embedded in the core, but it would be better than staying on the ground. Some of the mountain peaks could even be 100 times taller than Mount Everest. The canyons could be so deep that the Mariana Trench would feel just like a little rupture. Animals would also behave and look different. Cold-blooded animals would have to soak up as little sun as possible so they don't burn. Animals would have to rely on migration to find water in distant lands. Birds can fly for hundreds of miles for migration season so we'd probably see certain sleek-looking birds speeding through the air. But because gravity would be so strong on the colossal-sized Earth, the flying animals would need thinner bones and a thinner core just to take flight. The real survivors would be the microorganisms. They can live in extreme temperatures and pressures and can live without oxygen for a good while. The nights would be dark since there wouldn't be any moon to reflect the sunlight the moon would most probably be on the opposite side of where the sun is shining, so it would forever be a floating ball in the sky. The Earth's rotational speed is the fastest at the equator, so if all the planets and the sun rotated around us, then our rotation wouldn't be so significant. New weather patterns wouldn't be good for crops. Humans would have evolved differently from what we are like now. We'd probably be shorter and stockier since gravity is so strong. And because of the soaring temperatures, we'd probably live in caves all around the world. The strongest ones would have migrated to the mountains. We'd probably have the same evolutionary path as we do now, but other physical features might be different. Our pigment would likely look different to combat the heat. The desert fox has large ears for hearing out predators and for cooling itself down in the scorching desert heat. It's possible that we would also have bigger ears than what we have now for the latter reason. We'd be a lot stronger than we are, and our bones would be thick and tough to break. Gravity is one of the key components to developing our bone density and muscle mass. This means we would unlikely need tools for hunting. This would have delayed the Bronze Age and modern civilization as we know it. With little vegetation, standing upright wouldn't be so necessary to find predators around us. We wouldn't be the fastest runners either. 
but we'd be strong enough to fight off a pack of strange-looking wolves. And if the Earth was supersized, then it's possible that multiple species of humans would be roaming the land in isolated areas. Some human species would grow and evolve into the intelligent thinkers of today, but some would remain the same. And some creatures from the past would still be around, unchanged. Sharks would have been around since the dinosaurs era. They wouldn't have to change their form or adapt because of their dominance. Other animals would remain the same because of their isolation. The Galapagos Island hosts some unique animals because they've been alone for so long. Without proper predators constantly lurking around them, they don't fear humans. The new mega-sized Earth would have areas as large as Asia filled with isolated animals that could remain the exact same as when they first appeared. The human species of those regions would also remain the same, since they wouldn't have moved or experimented with anything. Their diet would remain the same, and they would get used to the climate they're in. Technology would also have flourished differently in various parts of the planet. With some areas in complete isolation, they wouldn't have access to new gadgets and inventions. It would be like living on a planet with different eras in the present day. Other areas would be so advanced, they might even be flying themselves outside the planet in search of truth and answers. Our gravity is good enough for us to live properly and develop life. But if we pumped up our size to that of Jupiter, then gravity would crush us. And being the size of the sun, Earth wouldn't even be a planet, but a brown dwarf and would constantly be burning until it became a new sun. As of now, Earth is so small in our universe that we're practically like a grain of sand in the desert. On a cosmic level, we're an insignificant contribution to this universe.